rolling. Hi, everyone. I'm Barb Chamberlain. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of Active Transportation Division at Washington State Department of Transportation. And welcome to another session in the Washington Bike, Walk, and Roll Summit. So excited to have everybody with us for a four-day virtual event, and it's great to see people from so many communities around Washington State and beyond. We want to start with a land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual, and those participating are joining us from many lands. I personally am in Olympia, so I'm on the land of the Squaxin Island, Nisqually, and other people. Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes are two statewide organizations, and we acknowledge the land that their offices sit on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulela, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. We want to take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of the land who are still with us. If you don't know whose lands you're on, look in the chat in a minute, and you'll find a link to a map you can use to look up your place on the land. Without these communities and these people, we would not have access to this environment. So we want to take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of the land who are still here. We'd also like to note that we are recording this session and it will be available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington State educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicycles, bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 14 panels with expert speakers and free registration for all attendees. So thanks to Washington State Department of Transportation, Columbia Bank and Darrow. And I'm going to introduce the session and the panelists and the topic, and then I'll hand it off to them and we'll have a slide transition moment. This session is Retrofitting Urban Arterials, Improving Mobility for All Through a Community-Centered Approach. Our speakers today are Ryan Farmcombe with Parametrics, Emily Benoit with City of Vancouver, and Rebecca Kennedy, also with City of Vancouver. The city of Vancouver is reimagining the use of roadway space on several major arterials, including Fourth Plain, the most diverse corridor in the city and also the most unsafe. Today, you'll learn how Vancouver is centering design choices in the desires of the local community, how equity and climate change are core to decision making, and how local jurisdictions can approach tough conversations with local communities about changing priorities for finite roadway space. Our format today is some introductory time, presentation, and Q&A. You can submit questions to the panelists through the chat bar in Zoom, and we'll be watching that and pull your questions up. And we appreciate your feedback. So at the end of the session, watch for a Google feedback form in the chat. So you can respond there or look for it in an email at the end of the day. And with that, I am going to stop my screen share and encourage Ryan to take control. Okay, um, well, I'm going to kick us off from the panelists. My name is Rebecca Kennedy, um, and we're going to do introductions for just a minute, but you um, are in a panel titled Retrofitting Urban Arterials to Improve Mobility for Everyone. Um, I want to just briefly thank the Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, um, the sponsors, participants, and of course, all the staff and volunteers who made this possible. So thanks everyone for having us. We're excited about the opportunity. Um, to share this um, project, which we're kind of in the thick of right now and um, have a lot of lessons learned and I'm, I'm sure more to come. Next slide, please. So um, very basic uh, sort of agenda for today. We're gonna start with a little bit of background, um, talk about the sort of existing conditions um, on the ground today on Fourth Plain. Um, Emily will spend a lot of time telling you about um, the sort of challenges, opportunities, safety issues. Um, but I do want to note that this is an area where the city's not just invested in transportation, that's our focus today, but we also um, are taking a holistic approach to sort of a broader community development and equitable development framework um, within this corridor. I'm happy to talk more offline with anybody if they're interested in that. Um, but that does really play into the fact our, our our commitment to a community-driven process um, as part of this project because it's part of a larger um, 
framework for achieving equitable outcomes for diverse communities um, in a place with a lot of um, physical barriers to opportunity and mobility. Um, and then lastly, we'll just, um, of course, talk about some outcomes and lessons learned, and then we'll take your questions. So next slide, please. So we're going to do quick introductions. Again, my name is Rebecca Kennedy. I'm the Deputy Director for Community Development for the City of Vancouver, Washington, just across the river from uh, Portland, Oregon, fourth largest city in the state of Washington, um, and a city that is aggressively now pursuing um, climate equity and mobility goals. Um, so in my role, I oversee comprehensive planning and transportation planning, as well as our equitable development group within the city. And I will turn it over to Emily. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Benoit. I am a senior transportation planner with the city of Vancouver. Uh, very excited to be sharing with this, uh, sharing this project with you all today. Um, it's part of our Complete Streets program, which I run a lot of uh, the projects that we have in the city right now, making sure that our streets are safe and comfortable and people have access uh, regardless of who they are um, and what type of mode they choose to use in the city to make sure everyone can get around safely um, and in an equitable way as well. So thank you, I'll pass it to Ryan. Hey folks, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, spending part of your Friday afternoon with us. I know it's 3.10 p.m., so we appreciate it. Uh, I'm with uh, Parametrics based out of Portland, Oregon. I'm a senior transportation planner working very closely with Rebecca and Emily in the city uh, on the fourth plane project. And I'm also sorry I didn't, I could not find my headshot, so you get a disheveled picture of me backpacking on this presentation. So. Great. And next slide, Ryan. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick um, background overview, um, and then we'll just kind of jump into the meat of it. So next slide. Um, so uh, the, the description and my introduction, I think both noted that um, this is really a project where we're kind of reimagining the use of roadway space um, in a in a very unique part of the city. So this is a really post-war area. Um, it has a uh, bus rapid transit on the corridor, lots of schools, services, community-based organizations. Um, of course, given the development, you know, the time that it was developed, it really lacks a lot of safety infrastructure that you see in newer areas. And it's also home to um, the most diverse um, population that exists in Clark County, um, highest percentage of communities of color, folks who are renters, um, and, uh, you know, other, and folks who are transit dependent and use biking, walking, transit um, to get around as their primary transportation. So really today what we want to share is how we're trying to center design choices um, to meet the de um, desires of the local community and really to help contribute to achieving the equitable outcomes I talked about earlier, um, how equity and climate change are core to this decision-making process, um, and then sort of some lessons learned on, you know, how you can approach the tough conversations associated with, you know, repurposing travel lanes for other modes um, and other users um, and how leading with community voices and values can uh, make that change management conversation, um, maybe not easier, but more productive. Uh, next slide, please, Ryan. And just a couple of key things. So um, in uh, May of 2017, the city adopted a complete streets policy. Um, we were pretty late to the game in this, um, but if you haven't done one, um, or you need a tool that sets the stage for the types of projects we're going to describe today, um, this was critical for us. So it really provided that like policy mechanism um, to leverage our other investments throughout the city in support of safety and support of complete streets appropriate for all users, ages, abilities, and modes. Um, and it was intended from the beginning to really leverage particularly our pavement program and our pavement management program. Um, that's something that has dedicated funding all year round and, um, or sorry, in every budget cycle. And it's something, the type of work we're doing every year, and it provides an opportunity for us to really implement cost-effective safety solutions on fairly you know, extensive corridors and large areas um, in, a, in a real cost-effective way, um, you know, using the clean slate of pavement and paint striping signage and then some vertical elements. So this was a key, um, I think, transformational point in terms of advancing our, our Complete Streets program and um, safety as a key priority within the city. Next slide, please. 
Um, so I just talked about all this, so I won't belabor it, but essentially we are just saying that whenever we do anything, public or private project, maintenance, reconstruction, parks even, whatever it is, we are going to look at building facilities and we are committed to building facilities that are safe for everyone, regardless of your mode of travel or your age, ability, um, or comfort level. Um, and again, it has been sort of a transformational um, tool with which to advance these key safety goals. It does provide some flexibility, of course, um, in terms of the different built environment and the constraints that we're working in, but um, that core goal for achieving safety, comforts, and convenience um, remains. Next slide, please. Um, and so we've really used this over the years. You'll see this on this project, but many others to guide transportation investments, um, improve our streets, improve safety. Um, we pair any street change with education campaigns um, that really help to raise awareness about you know, how people are going to be using the road, but also who's vulnerable, um, what types of users are more vulnerable in different situations. Of course, I mentioned it's cost efficient, um, serves all users. It enjoys, um, I think, political and community support, and it certainly drives a lot of political and community conversations. Um, and again, it, it's really just advancing our goals for safety, equity, and mobility. Next slide, please. And then just really quick, the, the other kind of key, um, key policy tool and policy priority in addition to safety and equity um, that we are advancing through this program is climate action. So the city has one of the most aggressive climate action um, plans in the country. It um, is targeted to achieve, it's working towards achieving carbon neutrality by 2040, um, but we've committed to do this in a way that's equitable, um, that addresses not just existing um, social justice issues, but past harms. Um, and so we're trying to do this again within an equity framework that provide and um, prioritizes vulnerable road users and the needs of communities that have not been previously prioritized in the past. And, you know, I think we have in transportation this sort of idea that, you know, if we build it for people who are eight and are 80, it'll work for everyone. And I think what you'll see in this conversation today is that we believe if you elevate the voices of folks who have um, has been historically excluded from decision making um, in the built environment, we'll actually get better outcomes for everyone as well. And I believe I'm turning it over to Emily on the next slide. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Um, as Rebecca said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the existing conditions and what the corridor looks like today. Um, next slide, please. So right now, the corridor is a five lane road, it has two lanes in each direction, uh, and it has a center turn lane. The image on the slide is of a section of fourth plane. Um, so you can kind of see what it looks like from, from Google Earth. Uh, right now, there's inadequate and unconnected bike lanes along the corridor, and it doesn't provide a safe or continuous route either. Next slide, please. Uh, right now, fourth plane is really wide, uh, which is uh, why it's very vehicle focused right now. And we're looking to see other ways um, that we can change the way that the road works. Um, we've also heard a lot of uh, reports from the community and from people who uh, are pedestrians or uh, use other small mobility devices on the corridor uh, that it's not very safe. There's a lot of cars that are not yielding to uh, them, specifically pedestrians, as, even when they are in marked or signalized crosswalks, um, which is, is very concerning. Um, so one of the main reasons we're looking at this corridor is safety. Next slide, please. Um, as for sidewalks uh, along the corridor, they're all curved tight um, and they're extremely close to the fast moving vehicles. Um, two lanes in each direction, they're, they're moving quickly, uh, even though it's a, a tight corridor. Many of these sidewalks are uncomfortably narrow. Um, as you can see here, this is a stop with uh, the, the Vine, the BRT, um, and it's, it's very tight for different types of users, whether they're waiting for, for the bus, using a wheelchair, or walking through the corridor. It's very narrow and to share very limited space. Next slide, please. So this is just an example cross section of what it looks like on Fourth Plain Boulevard. As I said before, five lanes, two lanes in each direction uh, at 12 feet and a center turn lane. Um, and this is how it looks for most of the corridor. Um, there's sidewalks along the corridor and they range in width and there's bike lanes uh, intermitt intermittently uh, along the corridor. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, Fort Vancouver Way. This is just off of um, 
uh, Fourth Plain Boulevard part of this safety and mobility project as a whole that we're looking at. Um, and similar uh, to to Fourth Fourth Plain Boulevard, um, two lanes in each direction. Um, there are bike lanes here and sidewalks, um, but uh, we are looking at both of these corridors together because they do connect. Um, next slide, please. So what does the community on this corridor look like? Rebecca talked a little bit about um, who's there, but I wanted to just dive in a little bit more. So Fourth Plain is one of the most racially and ethnically diverse communities we have in the city of Vancouver. Uh, and Fourth Plain Boulevard runs through um, this corridor, this our city's international district. Um, we also have a, a growing uh, immigrant population in this area as well. Um, as for businesses, over a third of the businesses in the corridor are minority owned or cater to communities of color. Um, and we have uh, five ethnically specific food markets um, on this section of the corridor as well. Um, and most of the businesses that exist on Fourth Plain do serve the local community and the neighborhoods uh, that surround it or just off of it. Um, and there's also a lot of social services organizations along the corridor that serves um, the, the neighborhoods and communities here as well. Next slide, please. So with five lanes of traffic, there's a lot of transportation um, concerns and issues. There's a lot of people on Fourth Plain Boulevard uh, that use it to get through the city um, and also to transport goods. Um, and this is one of the corridors where we have the Vine BRT. This is CTRAN, um, our, our transit agency's uh, first BRT in the city. Um, it's a very transit, uh, we do have a transit dependent population here. Um, and this is one of their busiest corridors that serves almost 2 million trips every year, uh, which is great. So part of this will also be looking at how do we get more people uh, better access to transit as well. Um, and some of the issues that are on the corridor, um, we see that a lot of the intersections operate at a level of service D or worse. We know there's a lot of congestion and traffic for, for vehicles here. Um, and there's a lot of safety concerns, uh, as I mentioned before, with pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, and we're looking to make the corridor safer for everyone, including the drivers um, on this corridor. So uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the safety concerns. Um, in addition to the complete streets policy and, and this being a complete streets project, uh, this is also one of the highest crash corridors in the city. Um, this map uh, on the slide shows where there have been um, crashes involving pedestrians or bicyclists. Um, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of dots on, on Fourth Plain. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the reasons we're looking at this corridor. We wanna um, you know, not only reduce uh, driver uh, collisions, but more specifically bicycle and pedestrian collisions. Um, so uh, what I'd also like to note, there's one, uh, one dot here uh, that's noted as a fatal uh, crash. It involved a pedestrian um, at the intersection of Fort Vancouver Way, or Fort Vancouver Way and Fourth Plain Boulevard. Um, and also on the far right side of this image uh, where our quarter ends for this project is Andreessen Road. Um, and there's a lot of dots clustered there. So we also know that that intersection is um, a high, high crash intersection. Um, so there's a lot of, of safety concerns. It's a high volume, uh, wide road, uh, and really we're looking to see how we can make this safer for everyone who uses it um, at all times. So with that, uh, a little bit of existing conditions, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan to talk about uh, what we've been hearing from the community and our community-driven process. Yeah, thanks Emily. And I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about uh, where our team is headed with the potential uh, design solutions for this corridor. And then I'll turn it back to Rebecca to talk a little bit more about the community process. Um, first, you know, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, the Complete Streets program is really leveraging to the maximum extent possible the citywide paving program um, to, to kind of get the best bang for the buck when the city is out there already redoing a street. What else could be done to make it more safe and comfortable and useful for other users? And so one of our principal tools in the toolbox, and this was identified several years back to address these issues, uh, is a road diet or a lane reconfiguration. Uh, there are, are many names, um, but it's essentially a road diet is repurposing lane space uh, for other users. Uh, I'm sure many of you who are in attendance here today have, have seen one or driven on a corridor where this has happened, but it typically happens on a on our four and five lane corridors, you reduce it to a, a three lane cross section, and that other room is used for cyclists, people walking, transit, et cetera. 
And these are really proven interventions. Um, you know, not only are they cost effect effective, they are very effective. Uh, depending on the corridor and the conditions, there's uh, market increases in safety, improvements in safety for all users, not just people walking and cycling, but also actually drivers in these corridors. Uh, they, they, they reduce conflicts, they reduce speeding. Um, and importantly for us, uh, they also this also creates the opportunity for allocating more space uh, to users like people uh, walking or rolling or trying to access the bus. You know, as Emily talked about, there are bike lanes on part of the corridor today and there are sidewalks. However, they're not super comfortable when they're right up against uh, a lot of traffic moving quickly. So we are repaving the corridors. Um, it's going to happen in two phases, partly in 2023 and partly in 2024. Um, but at the moment, there is not a lot of uh, additional funds available for capital intensive interventions. Um, so with this project, we're not necessarily talking about widening sidewalks um, or, or other kinds of interventions like that. That well could be a conversation as part of a future program the city is, is working on. But at this point, we are really looking at what can we best do with that curb to curb space. So there's a number of options. You know, also as Emily mentioned, this is a fourth plane is a really important transit corridor. Um, one of the things we want to make sure is that when we are reducing the number of travel lanes, uh, the the last thing we want to do is inadvertently slow down transit or make transit less reliable. Uh, and so one of the considerations in the corridor, especially where we think it might be uh, more congested, is dedicating space. Um, for uh, buses and right-turning vehicles in business access and transit lanes or bat lanes. Uh, we also uh, looked at on-street parking stalls potentially uh, on, fourth, uh, on fourth plane, but more on Fort Vancouver. Um, on-street parking is, is tricky on corridors like these. You don't want to inadvertently increase safety problems by introducing parallel parking onto a corridor like this. So it's a, it's a very nuanced conversation. Um, and then the other opportunities are increasing space for people walking and biking. And so you'll see here in a second that we have alternatives that greatly enhance, uh, that would greatly enhance the bicycle facilities by, by widening them and buffering them better from traffic. And while that doesn't necessarily widen the sidewalk for people walking out there, what it does do is enhance the separation for people walking from traffic, making it more comfortable. Uh, there's also trade-offs um, and considerations for all of these. There's limited curb-to-curb -curb space, uh, and you can't necessarily fit everything you want in all parts of the corridor. In fact, uh, the eastern end of the corridor is more constrained than other parts, and uh, there's some difficult choices that we're actually in the middle of working through with the community right now about uh, how and what to allocate. Uh, we can't necessarily fit a transit-only lane and a bike lane together uh, at the eastern end of the corridor. And so we're working to figure out what is the best use of that, that space. Uh, so here again, this is, I'm gonna show a, just a series of kind of diagrams to give you a sense of what, what's out there and what's proposed. So this today, this shows the um, bike lanes that are out there today. And you'll notice that there's a, a couple of big gaps and actually, one of the sides that Emily talked about, you may have noticed that there was um, somebody cycling on the sidewalk on Fourth Plain. Uh, and, and personally, every time I've been out there, that's almost exclusively where I have seen people cycling is people use the sidewalk. They're not comfortable using the lane. Uh, and part of that's because they're not continuous. So one of our alternatives for the, here we call it the, the bike focus is, is really looking at dedicating more of that freed up road space from the lane reconfiguration to improving bicycle facilities. Uh, on the western end of the corridor here, we're proposing kind of the maximum buffer uh, we can eke out for cyclists. And then as we get towards the eastern end of the corridor, you'll notice this orange line here. Um, that's where we propose a business access and transit lane actually in all of our, our, our alternatives uh, because our traffic analysis shows that um, though the corridor overall will actually perform quite well when we implement the lane reconfiguration, 
at the eastern end of the corridor, uh, there still can be some congestion concerns, and we don't want the bus uh, to get stuck in traffic along with everybody else. Our transit focus, um, and that's almost a misnomer because the, both of the alternatives really do improve uh, conditions, especially for people cycling and walking. But the transit focus uh, includes greater emphasis on those business access and transit lanes, bat lanes, which uh, again, some of you probably encountered before, but those are where the um, it's exclusive lane for bus, but also for right turning vehicles. The advantage of bat lanes really is that you maintain uh, access to businesses and side roads exactly as you have it today, uh, while creating uh, more space and more room for, for transit vehicles. But this alternative would emphasize essentially emphasize transit mobility in the corridor. And now just a couple of renderings. Uh, one of our options at the west end of the corridor is a uh, cycle track on the south side of the road. Um, the north side of the road, at the, this, the westernmost side of the corridor has a lot of uh, accesses and, and on-ramps and off-ramps from I-5. And so we looked at concentrating the improvements for um, actual transportation users on that south side of the road. And then here's kind of a, a generic depiction of one of our business access and transit lane alternatives, also showing a buffered bike lane where we have, uh, we've increased the separation between traffic for people uh, riding a bike and also dedicated that space for transit vehicles. And now I think I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ryan. So, um, you know, there's, as, as Ryan mentioned, right, we're, we're not going to be able to get everything in every segment exactly as we would in an ideal situation, just given the constraints here. And so um, we have developed a decision making process that's really being driven by community priorities and um, what what they how they assess the various trade offs. Um, and so we have this sort of community decision making timeline here. Um, we started with really like talking to people about safety issues and their needs, what was working, what's not working, um, you know, um, and then have really did, dove into sort of the trade offs associated with different alternatives and prioritizing different things in different segments of the corridor. Um, so really what our commitment has been is that we're not going to make any decisions about moving forward with lane reconfigurations or, or really any other improvements until we have heard community feedback and, and we can integrate it into recommendations moving forward. I, I just want to say that this is a continuation of a longer term sort of commitment to equitable community development and decision making in this corridor. Um, if you're interested in that fourth plane forward action plan um, is what has been guiding our work since 2015. That, that outlines about um, the key priorities in a lot of areas. So small businesses, affordable housing, access to jobs, education and services, and transportation is a huge piece. And so this project is a big part of us continuing to advance and implement those things the community told us in 2015 that we have kept hearing about in terms of their priorities for the transportation system. Um, and, and, and we've had a number of other sort of interim stuff. So there's this ongoing conversation with the community about how to continue to make this area safer, how to improve access, um, how to address their needs. Um, and so, Ryan, next slide, please. We are really continuing that um, through this, this process. And, and I guess I would say doubling down in some ways. Um, so we engage the community in the development of our evaluation criteria for this so that you know, essentially how um, uh, how we um, uh, will rate these various alternatives was also informed by the community. Um, so and get, we've been engaging a lot of stakeholders throughout the project. Um, you see, we've been tabling at events here, sort of meeting people where they are, the things that you hear um, uh, sort of as best practice in lots of these projects. We've used, of course, online tools, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about tactics, but I'll say a big thing has been leveraging the investments in community capacity that we've already made through Fourth Plane Forward. So we have a nonprofit that is place-based and serves this community um, exclusively. 
And they have built a coalition of, of community organizations, nonprofits, service providers, education and institutions um, that all work together, public health, to address the needs of this community and the, the neighborhoods adjacent to the corridor. And so leveraging those has been huge too, which I really think it's important to sort of um, locate this within a continuum of um, equitable development and how do we do things better to achieve equitable outcomes, not just in transportation, but in our community development and built environment investments overall. Uh, next slide, Ryan. So here's some of the tactics that we've used for this project. Um, you know, it's it's all the stuff you all are doing in your projects as well. Um, we have a real emphasis. We've got a community college in right off the corridor, several um, uh, public schools, grade schools, middle schools, high schools. Um, again, we have these coalitions. Um, so we've done a lot of sort of going to where people are at, tabling, um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one stakeholder meetings, um, uh, sort of more standard online neighborhood association stuff, and then a lot of interviews and in-depth conversations with community members. And again, our previous sort of investments in building community capacity have been really important in helping us find those folks and connect with them and able to have those in-depth conversations. Um, I think yesterday we did tacos and transportation um, in in um, various sessions in different languages. So we are also luring people with tacos, um, which come from <laughs> businesses on the corridor. And then I'll also say we have a very, because the state schools for the deaf and blind are located in Vancouver, we have a pretty robust relationship with um, communities that have uh, mobility challenges or other disabilities that they're, um, living with. And so we have been engaging those folks often. Um, you know, we know that this corridor in particular is very, very um, challenging for people who with with um, low vision or who are blind. Um, and so we've also been connecting with them. Next slide, please. And so you're not going to be surprised by what we've heard um, is that we need to invest here. It's super unwelcoming to do anything but drive on the corridor. Um, not a bike friendly area, super dangerous, safety is a key concern, um, it's unsafe, drivers drive too fast. <laughs> um, but we've also heard really good feedback on like, don't call it a lane reconfiguration, call it a safety project. Um, you know, tell us more about this. Will people behave well in these bat lanes or will this create like new risks for vulnerable road users? Um, so we've definitely gotten really good. Um, feedback, not just on sort of the, the safety concerns and the experience of people using the corridor, but also like how we talk about it and what people fear from change or from like new kind of risks that may come out of this design that we are now working uh, to address. So next slide, please. Um, so there are lots of challenges to this kind of uh, um, process. Um, you know, I was sort of sharing some just about the the fear that, yeah, you could change the road and it could get worse, um, you know, that kind of thing. We're definitely com coordinating really closely with our, you know, our traffic engineering group and our capital design folks. Um, you know, we want to um, increase safety for drivers, but we're not um, as, because of, because of the emphasis on safety, we're, we are okay with a little bit of decrease in, in travel speeds and times through the corridor. Um, there are you know, alternative state routes nearby. If people just want to go really fast, sort of from east to west, that's an option. Um, this corridor, we want to we want to facilitate all travel, but all all travel in a safe way. Um, of course, it's a change manage like all planning work. It's often a change management project more than anything, and I think people fear change. And this is an area where the road hasn't changed at all in a very long time, um, or pretty minorly in a very long time. Um, and then you know. A lot of folks, I think, want want everything, right? They want transit priority. They want bus, uh, or sorry, really, really robust, you know, protected bike facilities um, throughout the corridor. And and there are just places where we don't have the physical space to do that. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways that we're sort of combating or dealing, addressing, and moving through those challenges is just to really engage folks in the decision making. <laughs> well if you know and and educating about the trade-offs and why and then just you know having really open conversations about what what people really think given given 
the conditions on the ground and the resources we have to, to change those. Um, so um, we have a lot of advocates, um, particularly around um, bike and, you know, like small mobility scooter type devices um, who are, you know, really pushing for this corridor um, to be, you know, a very, very, very um, uh, um, robust bike facility. And we have other folks um, maybe who are at a higher proportion, like living in the community who are very concerned about transit and the frequency of transit because that's their primary mode of transportation. And so we're really trying to elevate the voices of people who live, work, go to school um, in this area, but also take into account that this is part of a network and people with a key east-west connection and, and it, you know, it, it um, is used by people all over the city. So next slide, please. And I think, no, I have this slide too. Um, so, I mean, we're just working with people to figure out how to navigate this compromise. Um, and so, you know, trying to explain the trade-offs as clearly as we can, that, you know, when you give bus a priority in certain segments, even in the widths, we can't have a protected bike facility um, or as wide of a bike facility. Um, we are looking for creative solutions. Um, in terms of like, are there key areas where it's just really tight where we could create, you know, alternative routes that don't have, you know, very low amount of out of direction travel and are connecting to destinations in a pretty good way, um, but allow us to sort of um, take some of the, the bike and other small mobility users off the corridor for those portions where it's really tight. Um, also looking for more money all the time. Uh, to do more um, and potentially looking at some of the more, you know, Ryan said there's limited funds for some of the more um, cost intensive interventions, but we are like identifying that there's probably some that will be needed on portions of this corridor. And, and so we're going to have to find the funding to do that. Um, and then, you know, basically um, engaging people in sort of being part of the compromise and finding the solution. Of course, that doesn't always work, but um, but we're trying. So um, with that, I think, Ryan, you and I are going to tag team key takeaways and you can fill in anything maybe I forgot. I think I'm going to I'm going to jump in on the first couple of key takeaways, oh, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so from what we've seen so far in this project, as we're still continuing along, uh, we just wanted to talk about some some key takeaways that we've seen so far. Uh, so first, if our goal is really to improve safety for all users, our outreach efforts have to include all the users. Um, one of the ways that we've done this on this project is having outreach materials in multiple languages. Um, we know that there's um, a really diverse corridor. Um, we typically translate our materials into Spanish. In this corridor, we've also included Russian, Vietnamese, and Chu Keys. Um, we need to make sure that everyone is able to see and understand and read what we're doing in um, a way that is um, best for them. The second thing that we've uh, uh, seen from this project is that um, engaging with community uh, is really important and not just a one-time thing. There needs to be multiple touch points, continuous outreach, um, and it's been really vital to the feedback that we've gotten, um, hearing from the community and adjusting uh, the proposed improvements um, as we go through this process and this project to make sure that this reflects the community's desires um, and needs as well. Next slide, please. A few more uh, takeaways that we wanted to just share is that um, the solutions we propose for this corridor really need to focus on the people who live and work, recreate, go to school, and many other activities in this area um, for what is what they need and what they want and what they're telling us um, is how they use the corridor now. Um, for example, like we just talked about, about using uh, bike lanes, um, we need to ask people how they'll use it. Do they bike now? Um, will they bike if it's safe? Um, and and what other uh, transit or pedestrian infrastructure needs uh, would be useful for them? We really need to hear from the people who are on the corridor the most, what benefits um, we can provide for them. Um, and also the improvements that we make should be uh, long-term and sustainable. It's not just a come in and throw it down, but how long is it gonna last to make sure that this corridor is really multimodal going into the future. We know that people are gonna change how they how they get places and we need to make sure that we're, we're building it not just for right now and for who's there, but for who will be there in the future as well. So I think at this point, I'll turn it back over to Rebecca and Ryan 
to talk a little bit more about our takeaways. Brian, do you want to jump in first? Sure. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the uh, third bullet first out of line. Um, I think that's a really important point that we uh, we've made a point to to remind people and 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 when we're talking with the the, the city council and the city's mobility commission, you know that no build is is always an option. Um, and I think it's useful to couch our al alternatives as, as and compare them to a no build, meaning if we just put the road back the way it is today, uh, because that really serves to highlight how how the how how frankly that the a no build situation just does not address any of the community concerns we've heard or meet any of the goals and so it's it's useful to keep coming back to that throughout the process um and then Rebecca I would do the fourth bullet too hopefully you weren't trying I'm going to do that one um but you know uh we all love data data is great um I think we've managed to go this entire presentation without saying big data um but you know what really um what what sticks with people is is stories and experiences um and when you're when we're trying to convey the safety issues on the corridor i think what's the most powerful things have been uh people we've talked to uh community members who said uh i i saw somebody uh get hit uh, at a, a given intersection it wasn't reported to the police but i helped her out or uh, you know, and, and, and all of these experiences come out um, and other people, especially people who might be skeptical of making changes, hear these, those, those stories really resonate and they resonate a lot more than crash statistics. So I think relying on stories is really important in this sphere. Becca, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, um, a couple other ones, you know, so we we do need to educate folks you know um this is you know there's a reason you know we spend a long time learning about this stuff like you know what people always like initially think might be the thing that fixes their problem is not you know we've all heard or those of us in, in government have heard you know like just we want a stop sign and you know like if a stop sign isn't warranted that's actually going to exacerbate your your safety issues and so really like taking it as an opportunity to like spend the time with folks is i think really important and um when you kind of treat the engagement that way and leave that space it it benefits you um and then i think examples from other communities that have implemented similar things are really important context for folks i think you know this is part of change management and people fear change right it's it's their it's the thing that's right outside their front door the road outside their front door or their business or like how they get to school and so um you know for this project one thing that's been important is this is a really robust small business community um the corridor has about 150 small businesses almost all of them are locally owned 50 percent of them are minority owned um, and I think there's a fear that making it slightly less easy for people to drive in some parts of this is really going to like make it bad for businesses. And so, um, you know, we take that fear seriously and, and you know, have been able to provide information about the actual benefits to businesses when people feel comfortable walking, biking there, or even driving <laughs> in a safer way and have more options that are comfortable and how that can actually you know enhance um you know what or could enhance what is already a really really robust um small business district so um i think it's important to not just say to people you know it's, it's unlikely that your fears will happen but say you know yeah other people had the same fears and um here's what we can tell you about it and and being really honest and transparent about what what those experiences from other places and the data says next slide please um, so uh, on behalf of Brian, Emily, and myself, thank you. Um, it's been great to present, and we will um, kick it over to the moderators for questions, and thanks, everyone, for being here. And gosh, there are some great questions in the chat. So we've got them in a document. I'm going to be looking off this direction to try to sort of group some of them. Some of them are really design specific. Some of them are more political and community vibe, and some of them are about, about your engagement. So. I'll start with some of the design tech questions, like what's the ADT, what's the posted speed, what happens to your queuing and delays and, and for drivers who are used to their needs being paramount. That was my editorial comment, not the questioners. 
um, you know, how do you convince people that a, a little delay is okay? Rebecca, I, I could start with some of the details on traffic. So we started this process with a lot of traffic analysis to understand existing conditions, but also look out to 2040, uh, working with the uh, regional travel model to understand likely future traffic. Um, and we actually even uh, developed a number of different future travel scenarios that included different assumptions to kind of um, basically do sensitivity testing around the traffic in the corridor. And long story short, what we found is that the east end of the corridor tends to get more traffic. And for that reason, we're probably going to retain uh, two travel lanes, one direction uh, on part of the corridor there. And the west end of the corridor is much less uh, heavily traveled. And Rebecca mentioned this earlier too, an advantage for, for implementing a road diet in this corridor is that there is a parallel uh, SR500 just to the north of Fourth Plain. So for those people who want to, who are using Fourth Plain as a through route, they can jump onto SR500 largely to accomplish that travel. Yeah. Could you mention what the posted speed is now and what it would, what you are proposing it would be in these alternatives? Uh, I can't remember. I, I believe it changes in the corridor offhand. I can't remember, but I believe it's uh, 25 and 30 miles per hour, depending on where you're at. Um, and we have not talked about adjusting the speed limit yet, but I think, Rebecca, what we had discussed was um, once, if, if a build alternative is implemented, reevaluating the speeds at that time. Yeah, I mean, I can just elaborate a little bit on the, and Brian, maybe after this, you can, I don't remember the exact ADT on the corridors. Maybe you can remind me, but um, yeah, I think what we know about this, because this is like, it's such a, it's a big corridor. It traverses east to west in the city. It's important um, for lots of reasons and well used that we're gonna have to have a kind of a robust implementation plan. So um, we're gonna look at sort of the other tools we have in place around um, you know, adjusting speed limits for safety, given the, what's appropriate for the new roadway configuration. Um, also um, looking at obviously a lot of education and probably some level of enforcement campaign um, at some point, because um, we do hear a lot of fear from people like, well, what if, you know, about bad behavior? So people speeding in the bat lanes to potentially get around traffic cues and making that actually worse for pedestrians and less safe. So there's like a lot of fear around like, could it get worse? I mean, it's a pretty unsafe corridor now, so you can understand that. Um, and then also looking at things like, you know, that uh, sort of more traditional tools like, you know, traffic calming on other neighborhood, parallel neighborhood routes to try to make that less, um, less attractive um, for diversion. So yeah, we're, we're gonna be, if we get the go ahead um, and it, it's looking good um, to pursue this um, full corridor reconfiguration, then we will be sort of then jumping into the next phase, which is sort of what are those, all those other things we can do to make this work well for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the questions was, um, what if bat lanes stood for bikes and transit? And I know in some cities let you bike in a bu marked bus lane. So is that possible? And what would you caution people about in that kind of a mixed environment? Yeah, I think on a different corridor, we might want to do bikes and transit lanes um, and, and and would feel comfortable um, combining them. I think on this corridor, given the, the volumes and speeds and, and just sort of the safety issues and sort of people's perception about safety, I think for cyclists to feel safe, we've got to get a buffer between them and traffic. And so I think in this case, we really want to try to get those dedicated um, bike and small mobility lanes and then a tran and give transit space too. And, um, but where we have constraints, we are looking at, you know, is, is parallel routes better or um, should we try to think about that? The problem is, is that where we're most constrained is also where we have the highest vehicle volumes and really need to give transit preference. So it's, you know, as course complex. There's an interesting question asked about whether you had looked at any depth design principles and things like lighting improvements. And that's an arena I don't know much about, so I'm fascinated to answer. So we've, yeah, we spent um, a lot more time with folks um, who are low vision or blind. Um, of course, I think, you know, people are much more aware of those considerations. Um, but yeah, we have um, 
we have, we do work with the school for the deaf and a lot of it is about folks who it's sort of more broadly applicable that, that there are folks who are um, using non-driving drive alone trips and modes to get to services that are located here or near here. And so it's a more kind of broad um, level of support for design interventions like the ones we're talking about. But yes, um, we have, we do work with the school and we have had like key areas, not actually in this corridor, but other places where, um, yeah, we've done things um, with lighting, road design, um, space. So like the spacing where, where we have like, um, in one area we have a crosswalk where people who are deaf are going to the school of the deaf. And so it's really well used by folks with that issue. And so um, they we, we've made more space essentially for it. So there's really specific design interventions like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Barbara, will jump in real fast. The ADT question, I pulled up the numbers just so I wasn't, so I was accurate, but the West end of the corridor is between 10 and 15,000, depending on where you're at a day. And the east end is more like 15 to 20. Yeah, crossing controls. That's a lot of cars. Um, yeah, I'm actually, I'm just going to say to Cascade, I think a session at some point on design principles, things like, you know, how hard and bouncy is the sound if you are navigating. I mean, there's just, there would be a really juicy topic there. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to some of the kind of community politics question. One was one of the questions was what really launched this? And you mentioned your complete streets um, commitment, but is it was it the what else was in the mix? Was it city staff? Was it state opportunities? The mayor? Who's the community? Who sparked sparked all of this? this That's a great question. Or this could be the corridor. Yeah. Um, so the city did a planning process for this with this community in the corridor in 2008. And then the recession hit and we laid off a bunch of people and cut our budgets and didn't implement very much of it. Um, and when I actually started with the city in 2015, my first jobs was like, we know we need to invest here, but it's been seven years. We do not know if the priorities are the same post recession. And so we did this thing called the Fourth Plane Forward Action Plan. And out of that has actually came the um, emphasis for a lot of our work. And that was a community driven process. Again, it prioritized basically four things, small businesses, um, access to jobs, education and services, um, safe transportation and affordable housing. And um, then around that, the sort of momentum has grown. So there's now a nonprofit on the corridor called Force Plane Forward. We've actually named too many things Force Plane Forward now, and it's hard to keep track of them. But um, and they push and they manage this coalition and build partnerships that push and 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 support the community in sort of pushing, but that whole sort of ecosystem that has um, grown up around equitable community development in this corridor um, lends itself very nicely to political support for some of these things that we wanna do. Cause there are real clear advocates who are um, from in of the community that they're intended to serve. Um, and we do pair a lot of this stuff with very proactive anti-displacement um, work to try to make sure the folks we're trying to improve the area for get to stay and benefit from it over the long term. Okay, That's a great bridge to one of the other questions that was about land use changes and things like increased density and mixed use zoning and maybe sort of what's there and what can be there as, it, as the corridor evolves. Um, it's already all there. Um, so it's already zoned fit for, um, you know, higher density, mi you know, mid-rise um, mixed use. Um, uh, a lot of the, that that was done in advance of the bus rapid transit um, investment. So knowing that this was going to be an enhanced transit corridor and wanting to put the supportive land uses in place. Um, and so, so that's there. Really, the, the thing we try to um, emphasize is the pairing of anti-displacement. There's a big fear that when we, as we improve things, people are going to get pushed out. This, does the city have explicit anti-displacement policy in place or a housing policy that? Yep, we have. Um, it's called Reside Vancouver. Folks are welcome to visit it or look at it. But yeah, we have um, uh, a policy on how we're going to do anti-displacement work in the city. And it's it's certainly a long way from being fully realized. But 
Part of that is targeting affordable housing dollars, targeting home rehabilitation do dollars, um, targeting our multifamily tax exemption, which can get us affordable unit or fee in lieu that can drive um, more affordable development in this area. Um, part of it is funding um, small business assistance and um, uh, we have a um, corridor specific workforce navigator that works in these communities. So it's a pretty robust um, thing, but we know that um, you know this is this is an area that's going to be increasingly desirable. It's close to downtown. It's getting investment. It there's a lot of potential for redevelopment. Um, so what we're doing, I would say, is probably not nearly enough, and we need to keep doing it and probably do more. Yeah, really impressive though. I I quickly jumped it over and found a link and dropped it in. Um, yeah, if you want to go home and work on transportation, go home and work on housing. Uh, like that that will help with it. Um, there's so many great questions about the anti-displacement strategies now. If you wanted to elaborate on those a little bit, um, I think that actually could be a great takeaway if there are other things you want to add. Um, you know, I think um, strategic acquisition probably is the one thing I didn't mention that the city has really gone in on. So, um, you know, we, we knew BRT was coming. We put um, a more sort of comprehensive community development strategy in place with the community first. Um, we've been, I think, pretty incremental in the pace of our investment to try to understand how public investment can impact the, the market and um, uh, housing investment specifically. And then um, we measure a lot. So we, we look at outcomes at a coalition level. But strategic acquisition of property is a big thing that we've been doing. So we've tied up properties. We actually are um, just next year, we'll wrap up a, a co-investment with the housing authority that included 106 units of affordable housing and then ground floor space that will be shared office space for community-based organizations that serve the corridor, community space, indoor and outdoor community space, a commercial kitchen incubator to help for to support um, food entrepreneurs, which there are a lot of in this community. Um, so stuff like that, where we're we're tying up the land and and then um, putting in those community serving investments that contribute, I think, to long term access to opportunity. Transportation is a huge piece of that, but obviously the housing and the resources, um, the economic resources, are really important too. Mm -hmm. And there was a comment in the chat that you must be doing something about rents to keep business rent manageable once so when you say investment yeah so that's commercial commercial lease rates are still relatively low on this quarter that is an issue that we are going to have to address in the near future though um, um, yep um, super um i know we're really we got about a minute to go and i want to hit the announcements and thank you all this is um, there was a great comment in here about like this is why this um, this session is why this summit is so great so and and i would agree and i have biked on fourth point so can't wait to bike on a different point. Um, yeah, sometimes I'm just there to make a point and it's not always a great idea. Um, so come back if you want to figure out how to find money for things like this. This is a plug for my own session. Um, Secretary Malark from Washington will open with some welcoming remarks and then we're going to talk about some of the new buckets of money and what to be thinking about as you look at opportunities there. Um, show us the money and how to get it. Uh, it is not a grant application process. You are not actually asking us for actual money. You're just hearing about it, just to be clear. And don't forget to do your feedback on today's session. There's a link in the chat. And thank you again. I need some virtual applause or something for our presenters for hanging in here through the end of almost the end of the day. So um, reaction emojis abound. Thank you for having us. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.